Hello and welcome to our final London Fashion Week Autumn Winter 24 review. I'm Edda Tetty Monik and this is our Fashion Beach editor, Joshua Graham. Hi. We want to talk to you about a group of designers who are really shaping where London's fashion future is going. And it's also an opportunity to talk about the realities of having a brand. I say that in kind of quotation marks because I think we want to discuss mm -hmm whether showing at Fashion Week means that you have the intention to be a brand, whether it should mean that or not. But we're going to talk to you about Paolo Kazana, Aaron Esch, Connor Ives, Jawara Elaine, Delara Fendikoglu. So let's kind of talk, start talking about Paolo. I mean, all of these designers we're going to talk about very much have their own distinct worlds that they're creating and very distinct approaches to kind of clothes and design. Um, and Paolo's kind of approach and the way that he thinks about clothing and kind of treats fabric is absolutely inherent to what he does. He makes everything kind of painstakingly mm -hmm. by hand. He made his London Fashion Week debut in 2021. He's a Sarabrand um, designer in residence. Um, and this season he kind of said that he was literally thinking about the struggle of the whole fashion landscape at the moment and also the world at the moment. This collection was like about the idea of kind of climbing a mountain and that struggle and it was set in the Old Selfridges Hotel which is where the BFC and New Gen kind of have give designers the space to kind of show for free and I think we want to kind of talk a bit about what is Paolo's proposition and what it kind of means to fashion. Mm -hmm. I mean we know that he's very poetic, we know that there is a theatricality there where that stands within the realities of being a designer and being a designer that's really trying to build a brand I think is still up in the air. Mm. I think right now we're still in the honeymoon of mm. this is a bright young talent. And like should it be a brand though you and know like be because yeah. I think there's this fetishization of new talent where it's like okay now they have to be a brand and they have to do this whole commercial thing and I don't think you know speaking to Paolo that's not what he is like at all. He's not like a sellout. He's part of Fantastic Twiles, which is the amazing kind of cohort of designers, um, which Nazir Mazar brought together and they kind of show, they make one of one pieces and they all put in money, have a space and they sell them and they get all the profit, all the money. It takes it away from the main system of fashion. So I think it's interesting to see how Paolo's become this kind of talk of the town in the industry and you have this show in central London yeah. which you've got all the foreign press coming to but then knowing that Paolo has always kind of carved has been slowly carving this area for himself outside of the system as well so I think it's important to consider this show on schedule for press alongside the other things that Paolo does and We've... maybe sorry to interrupt you but maybe right. also that we were saying yesterday was this the right Obviously, I think you have to consider that designers need to take the opportunity when they get given a free space. But is that the right audience for Paolo's clothes? Like, you know, I think they're so, as you were saying, theatrical. I think it deserves a different audience to this mm -hmm. kind of pinhole audience that you get at a non-scheduled fashion show. Yeah, we've been talking about intention this week and... Word of the week. Word of the week. <laughs> and someone like Paolo and doing that show, I. I don't think there's any denying that the clothes are incredible. They're so beautiful. They're captivating, they're whimsical. This season I thought was almost played into heroicism and really seeing these protagonists going through something and like coming out the other side better than they went in. It was gorgeous. But having that show in that space, for me, it was a bit of a disconnect. I think it could have been stronger and more thought out. Mm if he had the room to make it more theatrical. I think we always talk about, does this need to be a show? Could this be a really fascinating film? Could this be um, a really gorgeous, just still images? Mm. And that's almost what I want from these clothes. I want to see them move and interact and come alive. I and we don't, I didn't, I didn't get that in the context mm. other than it, thought it was really gorgeous. I think that can also be the problem with Fashion Week as a thing because it's like what Paolo does is you know it's all so as I said meticulously hand done by him you know the fabric's incredible it's all hand dyed it's like linens yeah. or ganzas and also him experimenting with kind of new techniques and ways to 
put a garment together and you kind of you can feel that magic in terms of the clothes it's not fashion for fashion's sake yeah. it's actually like this incredible exploration of how to put a garment together and i think in the rush and the schedule of london fashion week that can get so muddled and yeah so and lost. it gets so lost and that's not a fault of paolo's but i think a wider thing we want to talk about in this review is the kind of structure and support system. system for designers to be able to do that. Going from Paolo to Aaron Esch, who also is a beneficiary of the Sarah Brown Foundation, Paolo, for instance, they've just given him a scholarship to do his MA at CSM, which he's currently doing. Um, Aaron actually held his show at the Sarah Brown Foundation. Um, and I think the Sarah Brown Foundation is a great example of perhaps giving that space for designers mm -hmm. to do something kind of different like the Aaron show was very very intimate and I would have liked to see Paolo's clothes in that yeah. intimate setting yeah, yeah, yeah I said right after Aaron's show how much I would have loved to see Paolo's show there mm. um with like everyone at Sarah Brown because it is such a supportive and amazing family and they really uplift and support their their talents Aaron's show was really interesting because it was fully industry um, meandering around this small space. Tiny. Very tiny, very intimate. And it made me think about what it is Aaron Ash is trying to say with him and his brand. Um, who is he really tapping into right mm. now so early? Because that definitely felt like saying, I am a brand. Mm -hmm. I don't think Paolo's necessarily wanting to be the brand Paolo Cazana, which mm -hmm. is great. But I think Aaron definitely, this was a like, you know, kind of show of you know Kiki Willems opening mm -hmm. saying this is a fashion brand it felt almost like I don't know this thing of it being so intimate is like you want people to remember this early intimate show of yours yes. and there's yeah, this yeah. intention to have a much longer legacy in the future I think it was very smart for him to do the show there and I think it was very smart for him to have invited who he did invite because it is going to create and foster this if you know you know mm -hmm. um cool kid in fashion yeah, it's mentality. like all the industry editors basically yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um and i thought the clothes also really reflected that it was a real throwback to that early 2000s 2005 pete doherty um Kate <laughs> skinny, Moss, jeans. skinny jeans actually, model girlfriends yeah and rock store boyfriends i loved i heard that he took some jeans from the kate moss top shop one of those collabs and like looked at the pattern for it which i love and mm -hmm. it definitely brings that to mind and i think it's it's interesting to look at that kind of skinny, skinny silhouette and go back to his graduate collection, yeah. which we showcased on Show Studio back in 2020. And, and that was when he was doing men, he graduated in menswear. And a lot of the, I remember what caught my eye at the time was those pants and mm. they kind of, he'd do these kind of asymmetrical waistbands. And that was such an interesting kind of nostalgic but subversive mm -hmm. silhouette then. And it's really interesting to see how that's translated through to the women's wear, because it's very open with a women's look. And yeah. this was a lot of women's wear on top of the men's. And it's like, I think it's interesting to see how he's built up this brand and built that kind of, that idea of him as a designer so quickly through, you know, if you think about it, that he graduated less than four years ago. Mm -hmm. It's an incredibly fast turnaround, especially with the pandemic, to now create kind of a brand. Yeah. I think what he's doing really well is find, is balancing that brand building, creating mm. a really well-defined aesthetic, but also creating product that is so approachable. Mm. I think a lot of this collection could be incorporated into anyone's wardrobe. It was a real nod to almost that Dior Om Eddie Saman era with the glitter mm. jeans and like Cumberland waist belts. I think what didn't resonate with me with that collection was maybe the styling. I think some of the choices weren't my favorite, like no. Manolo shoes. Yeah, I think the, again, this comes into kind of, you know, Manolo sponsored the show and gave them shoes, but maybe the decision on which Manolos were included, because sometimes that just, it breaks the world building. And it the did, yeah. And the yeah, yeah, look yeah. of who this character is, which I think Aaron's so good at doing. and. I think it's also, you know, then it distracts from actually that this collection is made of incredible mm -hmm. fabrics. Everything is finished so precisely and beautiful. Like the level to this collection was so, so high. Yeah, especially with this show, because it was, um, he really leans into this idea of like disheveled refinement and not mm. being precious with these clothes that maybe you should be precious 
with. Um, he played with these 60s almost couture cocoon coats mm. that I thought and was really amazing. And then they're all clutching, which all is something yeah. he's done before, but I like that. But obviously paired with, you know, like skinny scarves that you could throw on from a bin of <laughs> garments and his AE caps. And it is like, there's a real lived-in idea with what he does that I really appreciate, mm. that I really gravitate towards. And I think it makes his fashion just really inherently cool. Yeah, it doesn't it's feel definitely like it's cool. Actively trying to be something. Mm. It feels cool, but it doesn't feel like cut and paste. It feels like something new because yeah. of that sense of kind of, again, similar to Paolo, working on the body and the sense of appreciation of actually mm -hmm. quality and craft here. Yeah. Let's not talk about Connor Ives, New Yorker in London, um, kind of one of London's kind of most talked about hottest brands. People have kind of been obsessed with it for at least kind of two or three years now. And my issue with the kind of Connor Ives world is I find that it kind of, it's kind of based on this idea of having these extraordinary ideas about sustainability, kind of the Connor Ives kind of went viral because of these kind of patchwork t-shirt dresses, which all the kind of Vogue editors were wearing. Um, but I want to know more about you know, I was having a look up into Connor and one of the headlines that came up was a quote from him saying he was blowing sustainability apart. And I just want to know more about like, how is his business model actually blowing sustainability apart? Mm -hmm. I think this season was like moving away from those t-shirt dresses, which I appreciate, you know, looking more into kind of what, who is Connor as a designer? How is he crafting kind of clothes, you know, something more kind of crafted, like the closing look with the kind of headphones on Tish Weinstock. You know, thinking about that Y2K sensibility, which has made him so popular, and how do you craft that into more kind of an idea of fashion that isn't just these kind of sustainable t-shirt dresses? But for someone that's kind of you know been awarded a fashion award for kind of was it Breakthrough Designer of the Year? Sure, yeah. yeah, I want to know more about the kind of real ideas behind this brand because I think with like Paolo and Aaron, you can feel it without it having to be shouted about mm -hmm. and. With the Connor Eyes brand, I feel like I'm just, I find it like it's just like this cool, cool girl, cool rich girl kind of brand, yeah. which doesn't actually have, to me, I just don't think it has any soul to it. And I find it disappointing when, I think it also comes into this conversation that we need to be more honest about where support coming from. Yeah. How are these brand, yeah, brands yeah. being built? Because for instance, you know, Paolo, you know, doesn't come from loads of money. But he's, you know, the support of the Saraband Foundation is really important. The support of New Gen is really important for him to be able to do this, these things. And you can feel it in the clothes that it's like with less, you often come out with more because you've really got to find a way to like say what you want to. And for him, it's like, and same with Aaron, it's like they're doing this because they, the only way they have to express themselves is through fashion, which is a really beautiful thing. And I'm not saying that's not the same for Connor, but I think we need to be really honest about designers like Connor Ives and Harris Reid who have all this family money behind them yeah. and they don't really have anything to lose so it's just like let's get all our best mates together from like all the rich girlies who I'm dressing and are buying my yeah. clothes and just do a show in the Savoy like I just find it I don't think that's where we should be putting our attention and money no. like we should be putting it behind Paolo and Aaron and Jawara and the other yeah. people we're going to talk about um, the designers I mean I love the ones I want to focus on the ones who I feel in my heart and soul should be winning these awards are the ones who are pushing fashion forward who have um, a point of view that says something mm. new and and interesting and it's rooted in such a like creative and beautiful place yeah. unfortunately that's not the world we live in we live in the world mm. where if you get the right support from the right people then you're gonna be yeah worn by the right celebrities right, you're yeah. going to be in the right editorials you're going to cover magazines you're going to win these awards when when we look at these clothes it's instagram followings that get you the, that get you the awards not the actual yeah. work that connor ives collection i i didn't see anything really redeemable for me mm. except for the ipod nano dress that tish wore at yeah. the very end i thought that was <laughs> well, hilarious. should we talk about some people that, some other people that we think are really putting this conversation yeah. for and exciting? Speaking about sustainability, we just did Chihuahua. Chihuahua this morning, and he does something very similar to what Connor says he does, which is take these t-shirts and these fabrics and create them into something wholly new. 
which is a very London idea for me as someone who grew up outside of, of the UK. Mm. Um, there's this real punk ethos to it and that comes across so incredible in Jawara's work especially because he's so great at draping so exquisite again it's, that sense of the body and actually making yeah, stuff yeah yeah it's that that maker's quality i mm. think that we should be focusing on in fashion right now but yeah Jawara's show this morning was eye of the storm yeah it was called eye of the storm and it was inspired by his the hurricanes in the Carib in the cayman islands yeah. And it was rooted in in this idea of taking what's around, taking what you have, mm. salvaging, and then yeah. creating something wholly new and beautiful with that. I think it, again, it comes back to what I was saying before, the idea of the kind of instinctual need mm. that you have nothing else unless you can make something from this and finding something beautiful. And I thought it was, you get that sensibility in Jawara's work, but then also these beautiful kind of tie throughs to that idea of kind of hurricane he's looked at shipwreck ideas before there's always this idea of kind of being adrift which I love in Jawara's codes like one particular thing I loved in this collection was that he took a pinstripe men's shirt yes, yeah, yeah. and wound it round so tightly in this beautiful knotted way that it became this kind of buoyant sculptural, sculptural um, but buoyant inflatable kind of, yeah yeah and it's that hand made thing that you can't reproduce, that you need to like be so in it. Mm. And I think, we, sorry. He's like putting a part of himself mm. into all of his, his collections. And I think what, you know, you just saying that there reminded me and made me think about, I think one of the titles in these designers we're talking about is like Paolo, Aaron, Jawara is kind of, and um, we're gonna talk about Delara in a second is, how do you, how do we support these designers who when we live in an industry and a kind of market which is so oversaturated we're in a recession you know designers can't rely on kind of department stores to buy their collections and give them money anymore after covid department stores and kind of retailers are, are paying designers even less of an advance because they're scared of losing their money so designers are having to kind of scramble to even get together their orders and it's like in a society or an industry rather which is so predicated on orders and product and the seasons where designers you know there's not really much space for them mm -hmm. to work in this way of having this sense of touch and these one-off pieces and that going back to that sensibility which fashion used to be yeah. it's like we really need to rethink as an industry and a system how we're going to support these designers who are the most exciting people and who are doing amazing things but are going to get eaten and spat out by our system which isn't built to support that and is yeah. is built to support sewn together t-shirt dresses do yeah, you know what i mean yeah, the, um, which moonlight is one of one of one of a kind things but aren't actually that interesting in terms of craft and creativity yeah i think Full upheaval is needed. Totally. Unfortunately, it just doesn't feel like it's going to happen no, anytime no. soon. Right? But I think we need to just have these conversations and actually talk about it. I want to finish by talking about Delara Fendicogli, um, who I think if we're thinking about someone building a brand and a world, we're definitely seeing Delara kind of, mm -hmm. next year will be kind of 10 years since she graduated, so kind of nearly a decade of her brand. But I think the last couple of seasons we've really seen Delara leaning into we've seen like a certain brand identity forming which I think is slightly different to what we had in previous years like it's become very very popular but I think we're moving away from kind of the overt kind of paganism mm -hmm. of old collections and it's very much more this kind of demi couture yeah. world but in this collection there was also elements of kind of you know without dropping ahead of myself there were elements of kind of tracksuit corset tree and shell jackets with corsets and elements where you could see how we can get much from the demi couture label yeah i think i've always been quite critical of delara mm. for a number of reasons some of her collections i thought feel a bit reductive to mcqueen and galliano and that's made me kind of look at her and her work with an eyebrow raise mm. after that show i i'm Full, a convert. <laughs> full, I'm a full convert, a full stan. I thought the clothes were gorgeous. I thought the show was stunning. It was just like everything was so impeccably made. And yes, I think the, the influence and the inspiration from the greats of your 
ring true with what she still does, but she adds something to it. Mm. She adds this really distinct aesthetic and perspective to it. And especially when it comes to how she frames femininity and mm. womanhood. What was the show called? Uh, Femme Vortex. Because she's always kind of quite, always, there's yeah. always like, she's very outspoken and political and it's really inspiring to always see a woman that always speaks their mind. Yeah. But I thought it was interesting this season was the first time that she kind of said this wasn't a show about politically fighting, it was just about leaning in to femininity against kind of toxic masculinity mm -hmm. and just like an explosion of the feminine. But I thought and that idea of kind of looking at how patriarchal society, how the patriarchal lens affects women mm. and femininity. She made some really, really, to me, smart choices with this collection. It kind of opened with these reworked office suits and shirts as corsets and these amazing skirts. And it was so hyper feminine and beautiful, but it was taking this, this real symbol of toxic, hyper masculine mm. codes and turning it into something so, I don't know, sexy and provocative and really flipping that idea on its head. Yeah, and then I loved kind of then at the flip end of this you had you had like echoes of BDSM throughout mm -hmm. this collection and fetish and with these kind of laced up leather looks, red in red and in black, which felt so kind of early school Delara to mm -hmm. me, but here through this really tight and refined Delara lens of this like complete sense of the body and mm -hmm. I thought that that was interesting juxtaposed against these more kind of historical influenced kind of silhouettes. Yeah. Like she loves a corset, she loves a pannier skirt and all of that felt refined. And I also, you know, want to mention, you know, you mentioned the kind of Galliano reference there. And I mm -hmm. think, I think some people will be inclined to say that this was very close to the Margiela show, which just happened in Paris, especially because Dodaro was working with Pat Bogodarski, the movement director. Um, but I actually, now that I've slept on it, I actually think it's really sweet because Dolara interned um, with Galliano right before he started Margiela and she's always said that like, he was the reason she went to Central mm -hmm. Martins. And I think that there is a really sweet kind of adoration of Galliano and the amazing the theatre that he creates and historical dress doesn't just belong to yeah. John Galliano. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she's these... made that her own and it felt like Delara. Yeah, Victoriana doesn't belong to Galliano the same way it doesn't yeah. belong to McQueen. Um, s and influence also doesn't belong <laughs> to any one person. So yeah, I, I mean, watching the show, I immediately treated Galliano light. Um, but the clothes were just so good and so different. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to kind of re reframe the diet prodification of our brains. Yeah, where because... I think everyone just wants to be like, oh, what does that relate to? What does it look yeah. like? And actually... You know, it's very like everything comes from something, comes yeah. from reference, and there are references to lots of things in this collection. But it's inherently it's Delara. It's her point of view, yeah. And that's kind of, I mean, that's what fashion is, right? Like these grand couturiers start something, and then it's mm. up to the next generation to either start something completely brand new, which we know doesn't really exist, mm. or B funnel that through their lens and make it relevant for the context yeah. that they're making in. What Delara did so brilliantly was add such humor to this collection that it wasn't this mm. like stiff upper lip um, fashion presentation. You brought up the the athletic wear or I mean Delara's take on athletic wear. I love wear. the kind of like lace up pedal pushes. It was hilarious. The, like kind of amazing little jacket as well. Yeah. Or like these like jerseys that were just like cut up into like cropped shirts and one of the models was carrying like an actual gym duffel bag. I thought that was just so mm. clever and funny. But it's really clever to have kind of your demi couture looks, mm. kind of that end kind of white feather dress with the painted feathers on the yeah. bottom, that kind of beautiful kind of sculptural theatrical pieces. But then kind of those, you know, I mentioned at the beginning kind of more of a kind of jersey tracksuit top and shorts in the Delora way, it's been kind of, kind of almost corset ties through it. Mm. It's made a bit more like bloomers. Like she's put that effect on 
things that you could see being more sellable, if you will. <laughs> and I think it's interesting to see, because she's like dressing so many kind of mm. celebrities and girls, and it's become such a, a global, renowned brand. Yeah. Um, and I think it's interesting to see, and there's such a Delara fan, and it's I think we're seeing her start to build out how do you, how do you kind of create stuff for both that client, but also put out maybe stuff which is more kind of, you can do a few units for kind of retailers and put stuff out that people can just buy into. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited to see where this goes. Um, I think she said this was her biggest show yet. You could definitely feel mm -hmm. it. There was such an amazing energy. Hari Neff opened, um, choreographed by the same. Pat, yeah. I thought it was everything I want from fashion right now. It was theatrical, it was funny, it was not taking itself too seriously, and the clothes were gorgeous to boot. I want to see more of that. Mm. I want to see more designers really take that creativity and see what mm. they can do with it. I think it's interesting to have, to finish on Delara, who's kind of, you know, ever since St. Martin, she wasn't included in the graduate show and kind of did this guerrilla show. She's always kind of done her own thing, carved her own past, and had to kind of beg, butter and steal to make things happen. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think it's, I think we want to just close this by hopefully starting and adding to the conversation about what is the system we're providing for designers and how can we kind of support and let them let there be different avenues and different audiences for things because I think it's become so so kind of in this era where everything has to be the same thing and work through the same systems and it doesn't yeah. I think it's it's funny because it's tricky for any creative to kind of navigate this space mm. right now. But I don't think we've been more excited to see what's next. And, and I think to see how they navigate that space yeah. and what they can do with the constraints and the restraints that they have, or the support they do or don't have. Um, but I'm feeling really optimistic. So am I. And we went into London feeling quite bleak about it. And actually, yes. from the kind of bleakness and the restraints that are on designers and brands right now, we've actually seen some of the most amazing things come out of it. Mm -hmm. um, From the next wave. <laughs> the next wave, that <laughs> god awful phrase. Um, thank you so much for joining us and we will be back with more reviews soon. Bye.